Now, at this point, I just want to say we're, we're happy to take questions, but what we're doing is um, we are using the chat function and you can put down questions in the chat function anytime at all. Chloe, uh, Chloe Cavanis from the Buck is going to be monitoring that chat room and she'll interrupt me if there's something critical we need to ask. But if not, we'll, we'll certainly take questions at the end and I'll try and leave time to do that. I will leave time to do that. Okay, uh, just built a little bit more about the Buck. Um, we bring together scientists from really all over the world and it's, it's a broad range of disciplines. We are interdisciplinary in that sense. Um, we are trying to identify therapeutics at slow aging and the goal here is not really to extend lifespan as such, but to increase the healthy years of life or the, the health span. It's about attacking those diseases of late life in really a very unique way that, that very few people around the world are thinking about. So why are we here? Well, <laughs> um, there's a philanthropic answer to that and uh, Brian Van Wheel, our head of philanthropy is on the call and, and maybe if any of you have got questions about that, we can address that later. But the scientific reason why we're here is remarkably a series of experiments conducted by a scientist called Tom Johnson. Sorry, his name's not on the slide here. Thomas Johnson at the University of Colorado. And 30 years ago, he discovered in this tiny little animal, this is a tiny little roundworm called C. elegans and it's uh, about a millimeter in size. So even if I was standing at the front of the room with a C. elegans in my hand right now, you would not be able to see it. If I went around with each of you individually to your, your chairs and you held it up to the light, you could just about see it. But he discovered a mutation in a gene that made this animal live 70% longer, seven zero. So that's kind of stunning. Uh, it was stunning to those of us who read this 30 years ago and I was fortunate enough to go work with Tom for six years to try and work out why this mutation of a single gene and there's like 20,000 genes in the worm and just a tiny little change in the genome resulted in a longer lifespan. And what it was telling us was you could study aging and if you could find genes, you could find out what the processes are that drive aging itself. So find out what, what's the nuts and bolts, what's the mechanisms of aging itself. And we've learned an awful lot from the worm over the years and many, many labs now work on this. Most importantly, we've learned that lifespan is not fixed. The aging rate is not fixed. Aging is plastic. We've also found out that there are hundreds of components to this. There are hundreds of, hundreds of individual genes and proteins that determine how, how long an animal lives. And actually thinking about this from a drug point of view or a pharma, pharmaceutical point of view, that means you've got hundreds of targets to slow aging. We understand what the major hallmarks of aging are in, in, in not just worms, but in, in people as well. And critically, we can understand, we understand now that aging can be slowed with a drug. And this is one of the first papers to emerge from the Buck Institute, Simon Melov and myself back in 2000. We showed that you could extend the lifespan of this tiny animal by feeding a, a drug-like molecule. And that had a, a big effect on people again, thinking, wow, we can really slow aging with, with chemical compounds or natural products or drugs or something. And it's been, it's been 20 years, it's, it's been a long time. And you think, well, why, haven't, why isn't the drug out there now? Well, that's partly because drug development takes about 20 years. And we actually are now seeing lots of companies, small startup companies interested in, in, in finding these kind of compounds, not because they want to extend lifespan of worms or humans, but we think that these compounds could also combat disease. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that right now. Um, one of the, and I'm about five to 10 minutes away from getting back to, to COVID-19. One of the processes that uh, my lab has been studying is changes in proteins during aging. And I'm just gonna take a, a quick minute to explain this because I, I think uh, it could be quite important in all sorts of ways, including for COVID-19. So this is a process called protein homeostasis. And homeostasis really means the return to normal once you've been stressed. And, um, you know, we take our, our dietary protein in and we break it down into the individual components of proteins, the amino acids. And then we use our genetic instructions to build our own human proteins. And so we stitch these amino acids back together again to form chains. That's not enough, though. The chain actually has to fold up into a three-dimensional shape. And uh, so proteins have a three-dimensional shape. And I hope that you can see that I'm holding up a, a can here, a lacroix. And uh, you're looking at this three-dimensional shape and you're thinking, yep, that looks like that could contain a, 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 fresh, a fresh drink. Um, here's the problem with aging. This happens. 
proteins lose their shape during normal aging. And when they do so, the function of the protein is lost. So this can no longer obviously be a can. Um, that's a problem. And it happens in different diseases. It happens in Alzheimer's. And you may have heard of amyloid beta. That's a protein that undergoes this change in shape and becomes toxic and sticky during aging. And we think it has some contribution to Alzheimer's disease. Same thing happens in Parkinson's and other diseases. So protein homeostasis is the ability of the body to stop this from happening. And uh, we've been looking for chemical compounds, drug-like molecules that, that prevent protein homeostasis. And so here's the example of amyloid beta. And what you're looking at on the left-hand side here is actually a worm, it's part of a worm. And the little green spots is this material, the amyloid material. So this is actually human amyloid. So we've, we've made it, this worm, we've constructed this worm to express a gene making human amyloid. And when you make human amyloid in a worm, it makes these tiny little plaques, just like the, the plaques in the human brains and um, Alzheimer's disease. So we've been growing these animals in different chemical compounds. And here's one here called thioflavin T. And you'll see that these tight little puncta, these aggregates, don't form, uh, or at least they don't form until much later in the animal's lifespan. The animals on the left here actually are sick. Um, when these puncta form, the animals become, um, they, they stop moving altogether, in fact become paralyzed. The animals on the right, thioflavin T fed animals, are just quite fine actually and are crawling around on the agar plate the, worms, the way the worms normally do. So here's a compound that we've found that protects against this amyloid material from happening, from accumulating. So we had a hunch based on some other data that this would be part of normal aging as well, it just wasn't part of Alzheimer's disease. And we went on to look at lifespan of normal worms. So these are not Alzheimer's worms, these are just normal worms. And what you're looking at here is survival curve, which is commonly shown in, in um, aging experiments. So on the left hand side here, we start an experiment with say 100 animals, and they're all born on the same day. And so 100% alive here. And we come into the lab each day, and we look and see if they're alive or dead. And you can see that by this point, some of the animals are dead, but 5% of the animals have died. Then there's a wave of death through the population in the black line here, and all the worms are dead by day 22. So that's normal. That's the normal worm lifespan that we see all the time in the lab. Now we feed different concentrations of that, that drug-like molecule, thioflavin T, and the blue concentration here, you'll see the worms are not dying. They're still not dying. They eventually start to die. Now they're going down, and everyone's dead by day 28. But the difference here is something like a 70% increase in lifespan. So here's a drug that doesn't quite, doesn't quite uh, slow the lifespan by half, but it's certainly slowing sorry, the aging rate by half, but it's certainly having a profound effect on the aging rate. So what do we do with these compounds? Um, well, first we publish our papers, and that's one of the main products of the book is knowledge. We get it out there for other people to, to look at. Um, but then we also convinced our colleagues that it would be worth looking at these compounds in mouse models. And the reason for that is, of course, that mice are closer to humans and nothing goes into a human really without it going through a mouse model. And what we're curious is whether we can improve not just the lifespan of mice, but the health. And that's the most important thing because taking these compounds through to humans, it's all about health. It's all about postponing disease. So Simon Melov led a large collaboration at the Buck Institute to look at this compound thioflavin T, or very similar compound to thio thioflavin T. And uh, we have a big unpublished data set that's coming out this summer, which we're very excited about. Um, and I just want to mention one interesting result in that data set. Now, hopefully you'll see that I'm running a video here on the screen and what you're looking at is the skeleton of a, a living mouse. So this is a mouse that's in a scanner and uh, we're, we're looking at bone structure. So Simon is able to go in and measure all sorts of different things about the bone, the spine curvature, and also bone loss. And it turns out that mice lose bone just like people, osteoporosis. So in the femurs of these mice, the bone becomes um, less dense, uh, there's big holes appear, and actually there are spontaneous fractures, just as, again, in humans. So what we found is that um, thioflavin T actually slows down the loss of bone by about 30%, which is as good as almost any drug on the market uh, used to, to treat osteoporosis. Um, that's terrific. That's a really interesting result. But... We've also found, if we go down to the second point here, that it improves motor neuron disease. Actually, we did not find that out. That was a scientist called Holly Van Remen uh, in Arkansas. 
But uh, our own Julie Anderson also had this compound in mouse models of Parkinson's and she also saw protection in preliminary data. So let me stop for a second to just make an important point here. We were working on worms. We found a compound that had a beneficial effect on Alzheimer's models of worms, but also on lifespan, extended lifespan in worms. We go to our colleagues and say, can you test this in your disease, your bone loss model, your Parkinson's model? And they do, and they find positive results. That's kind of stunning. Remember, worms don't have bones and they barely have a brain. But here's a compound that's found in a worm experiment that's working in both of these. Well, it, it would be very difficult to explain if it wasn't for the fact that aging is the common factor here. Aging is the thing we are targeting. Aging is the thing that causes bone loss and aging is the thing that causes Parkinson's. So in some ways, this is exactly what we expect if our worldview or grand hypothesis of aging is really what we think it is. So we're super excited about that. And I just want to give you one other example. And the reason I'm mentioning this is it's a metabolite. It's something that we make ourselves, alpha ketoglutarase. It's part of our normal metabolism. But it seems to go down during, during aging uh, by quite dramatically. And so we thought, well, and it, it does great things in worms. And again, we thought, well, why not get it into mice and see what it's going to do there? And this is a long study, uh, principally by my PhD student, Azar, in collaboration with other labs at the Buck. And uh, you're looking at some of the, the mice at the, the Buck Vivarium, which is an amazing facility that really looks after these animals. And the mice on the right hand side here are normal mice. They're, they're getting old, they're really quite old. Um, uh, you might be able to see that their coats are going gray. Um, they're also losing skin, uh, they're also losing fur. You see patches of bare skin here. And many, many other measures that you would make, whether it be their sensitivity to, um, you know, a, a light flashing or the, uh, you know, if you look for tumors, these, there's a higher tumor burden in these animals here. But this is the, this is the normal case of an, of a, of an aged mice in, in our, our colony. Um, the animals on the left have been fed a diet of alpha ketoglutarate and they've been fed that for the last six months or so of life. And this extended their lifespan, not by a tr tremendous amount, but what it's doing is extending their health span. And just the coat color here you can see is quite remarkable. They're, they're still all black. There's no patches of, of bare skin at all in this particular cage. And these animals by many, many measures that we've made are healthier. And some of these measures are um, relevant to humans, things like grip strength. And we're, we're really trying to measure frailty here the way, the way that John Newman would done in his clinic at UCSF. So that's exciting. I hope what you take from this is the idea that we can do something that changes the course of aging. We can do something that promotes health, at least in laboratory animals. And that gives us great hope that we could be doing the same in humans as well. So how do we get from mice to people? Well, part of that is doing the right research. So working with clinicians like John and thinking about how we might do human studies. Uh, it does involve at some point small clinical trials, um, but it also involves a great deal of resource because in the end to make a drug is a very expensive process. And right now, the only mechanism really we've got to do that is through pharma and through biotech. And so what we're seeing is, and we support that at the Buck Institute, and what we're seeing is the spin out of small companies who are looking at this data and thinking this is important and maybe there's a chance to really build interventions that are not just beneficial for everyone on this call, but really for everyone in the world that would get access to them. And I'm very happy to take questions about that, that kind of thing. Okay, well, let's spend um, 15, 20 minutes or so talking about COVID and um, the Buck's response to the current situation. Uh, going back to this graph, this is principally um, a, a danger for, for, for elderly people. And we have to ask the question, why? Now, based on the biology I've been telling you and the biology that we've been studying for the last 20 years at the Buck Institute, there are some ideas why. And you, you probably uh, could you know, find some, some papers that talk about the immune system, the responses of the immune system in the elderly compared to the young. Um, Put, put short, uh, in short, um, older people have uh, chronic in inflammation in a way that younger people don't have, but also they don't respond as well to things like vaccines. So there, so there are many known differences uh, between the young immune system and the old immune system. And actually, 
some of the mechanisms that we target for aging are known to be involved in some of those differences. So let's go to the basics. What is this coronavirus? Um, here's the picture that I think is on many, many websites re uh, released from CDC. And what you're looking at is a very small um, thing. <laughs> and some people don't even think of these as living things because um, they, they cannot replicate on their own. Um, now, that's true of all of us. We all need food. We all need something to, to replicate. But this needs the, the, the machinery of a host to order to make copies of itself. So its reproductive cycle involves other animals. Um, it's a sphere. And you'll see the red blobs sticking out of the sphere here. Those are called spike proteins. And there's some other little colored proteins on the surface there as well. These spike proteins help it get into cells. Um, but the really important thing to focus on right now is, is the white material be in between. So that's the, the skin, if you like, of the, the, the structure. This is a really important part of the structure, making it a spheroid. That is fat. And as you know, fat is disturbed by detergents and soaps. This is really quite an easy virus to kill when it's outside of the body. And that's why, as just imagine the greasy pan in the morning after breakfast, and you know that if you put detergent in there, mm, something happens, but not much. If you put water in on its own, nothing happens. But a combination of a little bit of water and a little bit of detergent, and magic happens and fat dissolves. And so as you're washing your hands, just imagine all those little particles popping as they come in contact with the, the, the soapy bubbles. It is the number one way to prevent spread. And it's, it, it's so easy and, and you know, and we, we have this abundant resource of, of soap that uh, we bring to bear in, in this, this fight. Um, a little bit more about the biology and the current conditions. So here's an interesting graph that is, is talking about, first of all, the fatality rate. So how, you know, what percentage of people are likely to die of, of a particular virus? And I should say it is a virus, it's not a bacteria. And that's an important distinction. Um, you know, but bacteria are much, much larger, they're much more complex, and they are, they are able to uh, divide by themselves. And, and many of the ways that we go after bacteria, like with Lysol and so on, are specific to bacteria and will not necessarily kill, kill a virus. So the, the things that will kill are UV, but not on your skin, please, UV on surfaces only, uh, all detergents, uh, and soaps and also bleach as well is effective at breaking down uh, parts of the, the proteins in fact. So not a bacteria. Um, so these are all um, uh, viral infections and you can see that what we're plotting here is the, the percentage of people likely to die in an epidemic against the, the number of transmissions per infection. What that means is how contagious is this? How likely is it to spread to someone else? And if you go to on the way out on the right hand side here, you've got measles very contagious, highly contagious, much more contagious than the estimated uh, uh, coronavirus. Um, but it's as infectious as common cold, and we know how easy that is to catch. So this is not trivial in terms of its uh, number of transmissions per infection. But it's also not as lethal as some things that are up, up here at the top of the graph, like a, Ebola, for example. I mean, Ebola is just extraordinarily lethal. Um, but also that lethality also means that it can, it, can, it can be up and gone and gone because it's killed most of the people it's going to infect. Um, the estimates for coronaviruses, or this particular coronavirus is somewhere in this box. So um, maybe killing up to 4% of people infected. Of course, as we've just said, that's, that's higher than the elderly and at-risk groups. Um, not quite as infective as chickenpox and measles, but effect, infective enough to make sure that we are all in our houses today. Just a little bit more about the, the virus and how it gets into cells. So now the, we're looking at the virus again at the top and instead of the red blobs being the proteins, they're now turned to green. So what you're looking at inside is genetic material. This is the genes of the virus. And uh, it, the proteins on the outside bind to a human protein um, called, um, oh my goodness, I'll come back to that. Um, angiotensin converting enzyme two. Um, so anyway, it binds to this protein on the, on the lung cells. And you can imagine uh, this being in, I'll just bring up all of this slide here. Um, enters the body in the lungs through the airwaves. 
and binds to ACE2, that's the protein here, and is pulled into the cell. And then once that happens, the virus hijacks the entire cell machinery in order to make multiple copies of itself. And it, it even steals the, the fatty layers of, of, of from inside the cells to make copies of itself. And so um, the, the scientists at Buck Institute are thinking about how they can look at these different parts of the invasion and then the production of new viruses and ask, is there anything that we can be doing? So the first name that comes up here is Nevin Krogan, and Nevin Krogan is a, a scientist at UCSF and an adjunct faculty at the Buck Institute. And he's uh, recently identified a whole bunch of proteins that are hijacked by the viral proteins. And he's having a look at those and thinking about how we could intervene in that interaction. And sure enough, some of those proteins are also involved in aging pathways. So we're very familiar to some of the Buck scientists. And then down in this corner, I want to mention David Furman, Dan Weiner and our CEO, Eric Verden, who are uh, all obviously Buck faculty. And they're looking at dampening down the inflammatory response in, in the lung. Now, it seems like the virus has a role in, in, in causing problems itself, but it's the human response to the virus that, that could be the major killer here. Um, it's, it's the production of al you know, alarm signals that, that, that are, is overwhelming and causing damage to the lungs. So this is a, a, a massive inflammatory effect that appears to be happening in, in many people. And that is apparently the real danger. And David and Dan and Eric are all experts in different aspects of immunology. And Eric is a virologist by training. He used to work on HIV. And so they are getting together with many other buck scientists right now and huddling down and thinking about what, how their work is relevant to studying this disease and critically do we have the tools right now to start thinking about screening for drug-like molecules that we could take to our colleagues and, and make suggestions about? Um, this is a graphic that shows what we're predicting to happen in the outbreak. And this is a great um, graphic and I might actually be able to bring up the live website here. Um, yes, hopefully you can see this. So uh, we can send you this website. It's covid19healthdata.org. And it allows you to look at um, projections for individual states and also nationally. I'll just bring up the United States uh, projection here. And you can go to individual days and you can see the number of beds needed, the ICU beds needed, and the number of people infected with the disease. And you can see here that nationally we're looking to peak um, around April 15th or 16th or so. If you go up to the right hand corner, you'll see the the actual beds needed and the acute beds needed and the shortages that are likely to be predicted nationwide. Now there's a large error on the prediction, so it's not absolutely going to be this way. It could end up being slightly different, but you can see the, the reason that, that okay. we're worried right now. Gordon, we're not seeing the, um, the live website. Okay. okay, I'll go back to the talk. No. Okay, sorry about that. That should have worked, but anyway. Um, Give me a second here. And are we back? Okay, so I was describing a page that, uh, let me know, Chloe, if we're, we're okay. I'm describing a page that shows Yeah, it the, looks good. We can see your slide. Excellent, thank you. So I, I was just looking at a page that was describing the national need for, for beds and the shortfall. Um, here's the prediction for California. So if we come down to the dotted line here, it looks like the, um, uh, the, the peak of the outbreak, it could be around the last week in April. But if we go up to the right hand side um, and look at the beds needed, beds available, you can see that there is, uh, there's not predicted to be a bed shortage overall in California. So it's a, a, a much healthier situation, although we're still in trouble with it when it comes to ICU beds based on this prediction. Okay, um, let me just go through the people who are, I, I just mentioned, Nevin Krogan. Um, he essentially turned his entire lab around to, to study uh, COVID-19 a few months ago, and has published a large paper showing the way that these viral proteins are interacting with human proteins, and that's a great start and a great way in to think about how we might target this with drugs. And uh, as I say, uh, Nevin's a, a adjunct at the Buck Institute. Now Nevin has just started a collaboration with Eric Verdon's lab. This is a large national, international collaboration to try and uh, take candidates that, that came out of Nevin's uh, work, candidate drugs, and um, 
Eric Verden at the Buck Institute will be looking at the effects of metabolism on, on those drugs. So it's a, it's a big effort that we're playing our part in. Um, and here's a depiction of exactly what Nevin did. So each dot in the middle here is a viral protein. And each line coming out from the, the dot in the middle is an interaction with a human protein. So you can see this is a large description, a large data set of human proteins that might be provide targets. And on the right here, you can see just some of these proteins have been pulled out. And these are very familiar to scientists at the Buck Institute. Um, this protein TOR has been studied at the Buck. We've used drugs to intervene in TOR for many, many years. Um, the substream of these, these proteins here, who are again, people like Kank Pankaj Kapahi has been studying for lifespan effects of these, these proteins for years. And we're very aware, for example, Julie Anderson's lab already has identified compounds that regulate this process called autophagy, which is a way in which we get rid of garbage protein in the cell. So this is really exciting for us to see that maybe we had a role to play in this whole, this whole thing. And I, I also mentioned Dan Weiner, David Furman. Here's, you can see the questions they're asking here on the bottom, which is, is there an imbalance between the innate response and the adaptive response? Now, the innate response is what I just described, where we put out alarm signals and we ask uh, immune cells to come in and kill what's ever there or remove it. The adaptive response is where we produce antibodies to, to kill um, uh, uh, things coming inside our bodies. And it may be that that balance changes in aged patients and that the innate immune system is ramped up in some way that's, that's really not good and is leaving us susceptible to this virus. Um, also, Eric is looking at whether chronic inflammation is a, is a prime for the immune system for a strong innate Im Im response. And as I said earlier, the, the, the elderly people have an accumulation of uh, chronic inflammation um, in part due to the presence of senescent cells, which is one of the, the um, major mechanisms studied at the Buck Institute work by our National Academy member, Judy Campesi, studies why senescent cells happen and why they put out these inflammatory factors and is internationally recognized for our amazing work in that area. So I just want to finish by mentioning that we do have results and I know it's it's a nightmare information out there and, and um, one, one of the problems is that um, as scientists we want to publish peer-reviewed papers so we want our fellow scientists to look at those papers, find faults, come back to us with the faults, make corrections and so on. It's an iterative process of, of refining the paper and making sure that it's, that it's right. And um, what's happened over the last few years is, is a move towards publishing papers before review. Now, what does this mean? This means putting your paper on a website where anyone in the world can look at it and make suggestions about how it can be improved. Now, that sounds like a good thing, and, and it is a good thing, actually, and the, the quality of papers will no doubt improve as a result of this new way of, of going about things. The papers will eventually be peer-reviewed and eventually published in normal scientific journals. But there has been this growing um, movement towards publishing papers before review. So it had the point, at the point we're at now, obviously everyone who's interested in, in or has data on COVID-19 wants to get that data out there for the rest of the world to see. The, the byproduct of that is that much of the information that journalists are getting their hands on has not been through peer review. And the second problem with that is that chances are scientists haven't had an opportunity to check other people's work, to repeat experiments and see if, the, if it works in their hands as well. And all of that means, unfortunately, that many of the stories that even, you know, I will believe when first hearing on NPR or another, you know, credible news source, uh, may be based on publications that haven't gone through peer review and have not been replicated. It's not to say they're wrong, but there are some good examples, I believe, of, of some stories that have got out there that are, are based on, on single publications. Uh, for example, the, the notion that there were two strains of Corona 19, 19 out there, some that are uh, very uh, bad and some that are less bad. And I believe that that was based on, on a, a very limited amount of data. So. Um, have a think about that as, as, as you read. And so part of our effort to just um, provide a resource um, is, is at the Buck Institute on the webpage. So come to the Buck and, and you'll see a banner right across the top, the orange banner, and click through to our links there. There's some advice that I think we all could be giving to each other um, about how to avoid infection. I think you, we've all heard it all, but we want to reiterate that, that this is credible. Again, just think of the soap bubbles bursting those little particles as soon as they come in contact with them. Um, but we've also listed on the website and here some, some other credible um, resources 
uh, including, you know, locally Marin, Marin County Health and so on. So please um, circulate this information to, to your friends, to get, uh, circulate the website. And, um, and you know, we are uh, conservative scientists who um, don't normally go out. I would never on a talk like this and uh, put my hand up and ask for resources. But I think in this circumstance, uh, we feel compelled to, to do that. So I would, I would ask you to get involved and, and make donations online. Uh, those donations will go to research that's relevant for, for this virus and the viral outbreak and the changes in aging that, that make us susceptible to it. Uh, and stay in touch, sign up for our newsletter. Um, and we are, we are going as public as we can with any information that we have. And just to say a little bit more about helping and, and thanks to, to Brian and Chloe for, for actually many of the slides you're seeing here today, Chloe Kavanis has, has helped us with, and, and Robin Snyder in communications as well. Um, just to be as blunt as possible, how can you help? You can make a direct contribution to the Buck Institute at this time. Uh, you can also recommend a grant from uh, your donor advised funds or private foundation. And uh, we finally, we ask you to spread the word about the science of the buck and the fact that it is relevant to this, this outbreak. So thank you all very much indeed for being here. I'm so delighted to see so many, uh, so many people attending and, and, and staying in, in the room. It's been terrific. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet and uh, open up for questions. Okay, Gordon, the first question came in while you were talking and um, it's about um, pre-existing conditions and if that, um, um, hold on, why yeah. that's, um, some patients have minimal symptoms and others die. And if it's, um, if Bill Dasher, if you wanna take yourself off a of mute and clarify your question, you're more than welcome. But if I have it correct, you, Gordon, you can go ahead. Yeah, and, and I should say this, I'm a, I'm a, a PhD, I, I'm not a doctor, and I, I can't really give medical advice, and my knowledge is very limited. Um, but I will say that obviously pre-existing conditions is something we've heard about a lot. And if you think about asthma, and I'm, I, I have a, asthma perfectly controlled, no symptoms and so on, but if, if you have asthma that's, that's less than controlled, then it does seem that you might be more susceptible to infection and but particularly more susceptible to the effects after of course asthmatics have problem with inflammation it's a big part of the deal and so if you're already susceptible to higher levels of inflammation and other lung diseases it's the same same way um, that um, yes it's, it's going to make uh, it more difficult to have a successful outcome I, and I apologize to any MDs who are in the group here today, and I'm perfectly happy to, to be corrected and, uh, and someone else to come in with better information. Okay, Gordon, the next question um, is, does gene editing potentially play a role in destroying COVID-19? Well, um, we did talk about, I, I mean, certainly not immediately in any way, and gene editing in general in, in humans is... is, is um, uh, it's not a long way off um, and there are certainly excellent companies out there who are, are moving forward with that approach. Um, there conceivably could be ways we could think about this, uh, maybe alterations to that receptor protein that's on the surface of the cells. If we could make alterations there that were, um, uh, that reduced the probability of the virus binding but retained the function of, of the, the protein itself, the human function, then you could imagine that might be a, a place to, to try and block the infection uh, before it even gets in. Um, the, the same would be true for all these interacting proteins I'm talking about, that there may be ways to engineer them such that now they do not do. But to be honest, you know, obviously any sort of um, CRISPR or, or engineering in that way um, is got to be considered very carefully and balanced against possible risks. Okay, and um, the next question is, why do most people have little or no symptoms? I, I don't know. Um, but this is, this is a, a, a virus that's part of the larger family of viruses, some, some of which cause common cold. And, uh, and I tend to think that it, it's partly going back to the, the pre-existing conditions thing. And so if you don't have any, then you're more likely to, to be able to uh, you know, walk around and, and not notice. Um, it also could be the case that that is also an unproven fact and that this is another example of a story that got out there that, that may not be fully true. Now, obviously, most people will recover. Most people have mild symptoms, but the idea that there are people walking around with little or no symptoms may, may, may not be accurate at this point. Again, I think that was based on quite a small study. 
Okay, the next question is, um, what anti-aging drugs are some of the buck scientists taking? Met metformin, anything else? Well, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say that I don't take anything right now, um, but, but there's no question that, that buck scientists are interested in some of the, especially some of the very safe drugs like metformin. So those of you um, unaware of this, metformin is an anti-diabetic drug that has now a long track record in animal models, at least, of, of being positive for lifespan and for, for aging, and uh, is part of potentially a large clinical trial in humans for, for aging itself, uh, for, for a whole host of age-related diseases. So it's, it's of definite interest. Um, uh, we hope we'll see things that are better than metformin uh, eventually. But I will tell you the two things that, that people at the Buck do, and, and the first is the, the greatest anti-aging medicine of all, which is exercise. And, uh, you know, even going into this epidemic, I think we're all looking at each other thinking, can we do a little bit more in terms of exercise? Because, you know, being fit um, is, is possibly a way to reduce the symptoms. Um, it certainly is a way to, to protect against age-related diseases. And that, that, is a, that is a proven fact across a, a, a large amount of science. Um, the second thing is, is diet. And, and if Eric was, was doing this call, and actually if John was doing this today, John would be talking about this. So John's very interested in the effects of, for example, ketone bodies in, in, our, in our diet and ketone bodies that we generate ourselves when we burn fats. And it seems from Eric's work and John's work that, that, that ketone bodies are protective against a, a range of age-related conditions, may extend life, like, does extend lifespan in, in mouse. Um, and so, so uh, people are thinking about ketogenic diets, but the other way that you can get yourself in a, a, a or start making ketones at least is to fast or to have intermittent feeding. And so many people at the Buck Institute are, you know, eating pretty much what they want at night, uh, but skipping, um, you know, still a healthy diet, but then maybe skipping breakfast and lunch and uh, maybe a snack in the afternoon, but getting a good 16 hours of, of not taking any food. And many, many, many people at the Buck Institute are doing some form of that right now. Okay, so the next question is, you mentioned UV killing the virus. How about the sun and warmer climates? Well, yes, the, the warmer climate thing I'm not too sure about. I mean, the, the, obviously the sun will. So we, we can think about this in two ways. So first of all, I want to reiterate, do not think about UV as a way to kill coronavirus on your skin or in any other way. That's, that's, that's a highly risky. The kind of UV that kills the viruses is the kind of UV that causes cancer. So that is not what we're talking about here. We are talking about can UV be used to, to sterilize the surface? And, and it can, it can kill the virus. Although to be honest, why wouldn't you just use soap and water? Um, so uh, I, I, yes, I, and I, sorry, I, can you repeat the question, Chloe, please? Yes, um, you mentioned UV killing the virus. How about the sun and warmer climates? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yes. Um, well, one thing is clear that, that us going out into the sun or having a hot bath or something like that really doesn't change our body temperature. And the virus is not on the outside. Um, that, that, you know, once you're infected, there's two answers to this, right? There's before you're infected, is the sun going to help? Probably not because it's, it's, it's not intense enough. Again, washing your hands is the best way to go. Um, but once you're infected, does being a hotter climate or being in the sunshine or taking hot baths help at all? Almost certainly not. Your body temperature is set, whether you're in a bath or not. You're, you're, you've, the reason you've got a fever is your body's trying to kill the virus and it's going to do it long before you do it by some sort of external means. Okay, so the next question, there's a theory that some of those who are most susceptible to serious illness are those who have an immune system that is too efficient. Any credibility in that? That's right. And this, this sounds weird, right? Because we normally talk about when an immune system is compromised, that's when we're most likely to get infection. But it's this idea that once you are infected, that if your immune system is, and especially this innate immune system I'm talking about, if it has a massive response, then this, it causes this storm that, that essentially that causes a great deal of damage to the lungs. So yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, you know, I, um, you know, as an asthmatic, I would normally be taking, uh, I do take uh, immune suppressant and, um, you know, you might think, well, should I be talking to my doctor about this? Should I, you know, have a, a strong immune system to fight this thing? And, and do talk to your doctor, but I think that it, they're going to be quite confused right now. It's, it's, it's not clear, but it seems to be the case that uh, a massive, immune response somewhere in, into the course of this infection is the thing that's causing the most trouble to the people who have the worst conditions. 
Okay, that's all that um, there was one other question earlier. Um, Bill Dasher, you you asked the question of two separate strains of the virus. Is this possible? And I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate or if that's um, um, uh, sure. I, and again, I don't have any expertise in this area. I'm, I'm following um, some news outlets that I trust, and I also heard from um, there's a um, a website called um, Retract Retract Watch. Um, there's some useful information there in the sense that they follow the scientific literature and the editor of Retract Watch was, was making the point that, um, that some of the papers, especially one talking about the two strains, were, were based on small, small studies. Um, that's something that we'll, we'll find out. I mean, we'll, we'll have answers to all these questions and, and you know, maybe a year from now we're going to have not just answers but a vaccine. And that's where all this is heading in the end is, is a credible vaccine study. Um, it just unfortunately takes time. We, we cannot put experimental vaccines out there. Um, and, uh, and of course, vaccines don't treat people. They, they prevent the disease in the first place. So um, lots so that, of work to be done. That brings me to the next question, Gordon. Mm -hmm. If you had to guess, is it a vaccine or some type of antibody that will be the solution? Yeah, well, a vaccine is, is, is an agent that, that, that generates a, a tricks our own bodies into making antibodies against the virus so so it's both in that sense that a vaccine will will help us generate the antibodies is it an antibody that comes from the outside that we manufacture uh possibly there are certainly antibody drugs out there for sure um is it a small chemical molecule that that acts as a drug and prevents the interaction of the the vaccine with with cells or or changes the cell machinery and sometimes it could could be that as well um I, I, you know, I, if we had a, an expert on virology on here, they might be able to give you a really good lead as to what's most likely. But I think right now everyone is doing everything on all fronts. Okay, so the president is an advocate of a malaria drug to treat COVID. Any thoughts on that? Well, this gets at this this idea of of a massive innate immune response, and and some of the some of the drugs that are uh, thought to dampen down immune response. Um, are, are potential candidates. And the problem, as we know, is that if we, you know, go out there with information at that level, um, then a lot of people are going to be influenced by it. Now, the FDE have actually approved that drug for use in COVID-19. And whether that's, be, and it, but it's based on almost no data at all. Um, that is a drug that's probably, has side effects. Um, so we need to be careful. But if you think about the worst cases, um, you are going to go in with what is essentially an experimental drug at this point for, for this condition. So um, yeah, look to the FDA website for advice on that. Um, there's some other anti-inflammatory uh, drugs that are being talked about as well. I just had a, I had a noted down some names, but I don't see her right now. Um, but yes, it's, it's a candidate for sure. And, and in a way that you, know, you wouldn't expect if you were thinking about uh, just trying to prevent the disease. It's, it's a way to treat the, the human response to the, the virus. Okay, so we're at, um, we're just three minutes away from the hour and um, we've come to the end of the questions that were asked on the chat. Is, are there any other questions, last minute questions before we um, adjourn? Um, and what about golf right now? <laughs> Um, <laughs> meaning, can we play golf? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, no, we can't. We can't play golf. Um, <laughs> and that's partly because uh, people just get too close together and all the golf courses are closed. And um, yeah, it'll be a while, I'm afraid. Yes, I know a lot of people who'd like to be playing tennis and doing some other yeah. things as well. Too bad yeah. right now. Okay, well, thank you so much, Gordon, for doing this talk on a Sunday afternoon. I'm um, Sure, if everyone was unmuted, they'd be saying the same. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of the 49 participants who are on, on this call. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, everyone, for joining. And again, just uh, uh, best wishes to, to John Newman and all his colleagues down, down in the city. Thank you. Have a good rest of the weekend, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.